Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Today, ladies and gentlemen, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, can't remember now, everything's uh, escalating so fast in this world that we're in and the year, I mean, we're in April already, I can't believe it. Um, you may remember we had former police officer Gary Waterman on the show and we were talking about the huge fraud with company house and companies registering uh, one name trading in a different name and and all of this and and since that information has gone out um, Gary of course has been inundated with amazing uh, emails contacts and a whole host of different things people have been getting in touch with me saying how do I get on touch with Gary there is so much to um, look at and explore so I thought it was only sensible to get him back on the show and find out what in the short space of time has been going on. Gary in a van somewhere um, in this country, I assume, on the in hiding as ever. Uh, how are you, Gary? Welcome back. Very well. Thank you very much, Richard, for letting me have a second opportunity to come back and speak to you. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. Um, a lot of people have been fascinated by what you were revealing. Uh, a lot of people being, as I said, in touch with me saying, oh, my God, you know, I, I hadn't known the extent of all of this. Some people were coming back actually saying, yeah, I've heard about this in the long distance past, but, you know, didn't know what to do about it. You're somebody who is, you know, you put your life on the line uh, in order to reveal all the, all of this. And I th suppose your background as a former police officer has given you a lot of insight on ways to proceed and reveal this information, which the ordinary everyday person just doing a little bit of um, keyboard worrying doesn't have. So that's, you know, we're all very grateful to what the sort of thing you were doing. So since you came on the show, and I know you've been interviewed by other people and things have been going on, um, I thought it'd be good to have a little update. Maybe you could uh, tell us what's been going on since. Yeah, of course, Richard. First of all, I mean, you've touched on it. I'd like to say a huge thank you to everybody that's contacted me. I, I've really been quite humbled, to be honest with you, about the support. I mean, I've had so many people saying, come and live with us for a while. You know, we'll look after you and your wife and you can hide the van and so many people. So I just want to say very humbling. There's some incredible people. And thank you so much to those individuals. So um, since I last spoke to you, there's been um, a lot of a lot of things going on uh, in the background. Uh, I've done several videos since. Um, and the thing I've been really focusing on is the child protection issue, uh, because it's very important um, in everybody's minds, of course, and for the children. Um, so I've been focusing on that. And uh, I'm not going to mention specifics, but there was one child uh, that was funny enough. It was the first family that contacted me once I started, started highlighting the connections to the fraud. Uh, and Max Clifford, Ghislaine Maxwell and uh, Jeffrey Epstein, I started getting contact. And a particular family, the very first one that contacted me, turned out to be the key to all of this. Um, wow. Now, what I mean by that is that child connected all of the uh, evidence of the fraud through to uh, an offshore parliamentary uh, group that had been set up in relation to islands around the UK. Um, and that parliamentary group linked very quickly through Companies House to Gile Maxwell. So she was a previous director or secretary for a company within one company away from those members of that offshore parliamentary group. That then led to um, information uh, in relation to uh, possible child abuse and even more sinister things happening on some of the islands around the UK, which then led to further investigations that then exposed uh, the police officers that were in charge of that investigation back into being part of this system of fraud and potentially child trafficking through the company's house registers, register. There's been lots and lots of evidence going on and, and it links through back through to politicians very, very quickly as well. Remember, there's over 5 million companies, you know, and these linked in incredibly quickly, including to uh, what appears to be a department at Heathrow Airport that may be being used to bypass security to allow whatever you want to believe that they may be allowing to come into this country. Um, so there's been lots and lots of developments. Um, none of the organisations are responding at all. I'm I've had surprised. no response. Yep, nothing at all. No reassurances that they're looking into it. No um, information to contradict the information I'm presenting. Um, 650 MPs we're talking about, even my local MP is not responding. You, 
your viewers may have seen one of my videos contacting the specific the police force specifically in relation to this child where i was told that the officer in the case would be in contact with me about this evidence i'm uh, finding no contact no contact mm. nothing from hmrc uh, you know there was because it all links through to the taxation system uh, so i did a call a few weeks ago now uh, to hmrc even the representative on the line agreed with me that the taxation system is a fraudulent criminal process this is one of hms hmrc's own representatives uh, right. and i was told that the a supervisor would contact me to finalize my complaint about all of this i have had no contact whatsoever from hmrc there's now evidence through um the uh the information i'm looking at that shows that they're now shutting down hmrc companies and also that the HMRC uh, self-employed line is actually being shut down for several months. Now, all of these things shout uh, very loudly that there's something very uh, true about what I'm saying. Right. And, um, and, and I mean, apart from it sticking their head in the sand, um, which, which is one sort of interpretation, but th they just do this, don't they? They just go, we'll, we'll shut ourselves off from all of this. We're not going to say anything. We're not going to confirm anything. Because even if they say, even if they deny anything, suddenly they're, they're digging a deeper hole. So they're just being quiet. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not even about, you know, not saying anything. There's things they could be doing to stop this carrying on. Yes. You know, they're, they're already aware of this. There was an article in the Ham and High article in 2019, in May 2019. And this system of companies' house fraud was highlighted to the government in that article, OK? They suggested within that article that the government was going to be doing something about it. And yet here we are in the same position. OK, now they're trying to show that they are doing something. So I think I mentioned it on the last interview with you. So Companies House have now publicised proposals to verify some companies' details, but they're not doing it for everyone. It says that within their wording. So, you know, this is clearly a sign that they're allowing it to be to continue and to maybe be selective on who use the system of fraud. It's not good enough. And by no. everything they're doing, all they're doing is just digging a deeper and deeper hole which is now why they are, um, which I mentioned to you prior to the interview, the uh, SWIFT international banking system are now panicking uh, and they're now expediting a transition to a central bank digital currency. And I, I thought this might happen. Um, and that means that uh, they're looking to remove cash or go to a cashless society sometimes in the in the near future now that is going to be a huge problem for us all and i will explain why at the moment you and i can withhold our or most of us can withhold our taxes as a form of peaceful process uh, protest uh, if they the government are trying to impose uh, unlawful policies or something that they know the people would not be happy about without consultation mm. we would have the ability to withhold our taxes and still have the ability to use cash to survive if they froze accounts, for et cetera, et cetera uh, because we were protesting. If they remove cash, that ability is gone, okay, because they will be able to freeze accounts, take money from accounts without us even knowing. Um, and let's not forget, um, I've done a recent video, the SWIFT international transaction system is a fraudulent entity system, okay? Most banks use this international transaction system. It has been set up with false entity companies. In fact, the same companies that started up my company that I'm still a shareholder for, where this all started, the very same company was used to start up the SWIFT international transaction system that all banks used. So it's already a fraudulent system, and they will know that because, mm. of course, these people would have had financial advisors, solicitors involved in setting up these companies they would most certainly have known that the company's house register has to be done correctly and that those companies have to be registered lawfully without fraudulent um, registration. But it still happened. So they know exactly what they're doing. And that means there's a very good chance they're just going to try and move the fraudulent system into the central bank digital currency system. And that is going to be a huge problem for us all. And you said you said to me before we started recording that the original plan for the CBDCs is much later on, in 2030, I think you mentioned. Um, and we've, you know, we've been talking about the advent of this, and people haven't quite worked out when it was going to happen. And they tried it out in places like I think Nigeria was one in which it was rejected. Um, 
by bringing these things forward, it shows a that they're panicking uh, and they've fallen off their time scale. Do you think, though? I mean, trying to put a bit of a positive spin on it, it does seem that as they start to panic and they start to bring all this stuff forward, and they've been doing this, it seems to me, for some time, the wheels are falling off their bus because in their panic, they're making mistakes. They are, but it does also mean they're getting closer to an unstoppable system because if if you imagine you've got people that want to protest, but they yeah. have families, they have to have a roof over their head, they're going to be worrying that their banks are going to be frozen. So you're going to have people less likely to stand up and oppose what the government are doing. And we all know they're not consulting the public on many things. They haven't consulted us on the bombing of the children in uh, Gaza. You know, that will be a thing of the future. We will not be consulted on many of the policy changes. OK, and they will just impose them, even if it fits their narrative criminal system against what is right for the general public and the environment. And that is now a very real danger very real so do you think they can do anything before the next general election well like i said the time scale for the swift international transition they've said between 12 and 24 months um i mean i don't know they're, they're going to be panicking uh, there's a lot of people running around with their feathers ruffled i should imagine the banking system um who knows what the next step is but uh, the only thing i can think of is they need to implement the five um, measures that I've suggested or something very similar. And I think everybody will agree that these things now have to be done with this evidence. Now, I think we touched on it in your last interview. Uh, so until somebody says that they agree, somebody within a position of power says that they agree that there has to now be a transparent taxation system, uh, mm. the source of the payments within a bank account so we can see the collective income and expenditure. Until someone says that, we can't trust them until somebody says we agree and we are going to implement verification of all companies details so that we can be sure that there is no illegitimate activity or fraudulent activity or child trafficking involved in it. We can't trust anybody. That is my personal view, of course. Yes. You know, until somebody agrees that we need to put something better in place to stop members of parliament being able to make decisions for their own financial or affiliated um, incentives and something is needs to be better in place to prevent that with very strict consequences if they're involved in doing it they cannot be trusted these things have to now be put in place because of this it's that crucial and that important yes i mean trust is i, I would uh, say that trust is gone in all government up and down the country since the pandemic 100 percent I mean, don't, I, I was a, um, and somebody has actually pointed out, I need to say that I was uh, an acting police sergeant as well. They've said, you know, don't be afraid to say that because it shows the position I had. And this yes. is, you know, I was an acting police sergeant and I'm saying this is wrong. You know, I was within this system trying to do my best for the public. I knew nothing about this. And there will be, like we said, I think before, many, many police officers that do not know anything about this. They're completely innocent. And I will be doing a video soon. And I'll say it now, guys, you need to come forward. You need to realize what you are part of. Your police crime commissioners are corrupted and compromised by this system. Your chief constables are corrupted by this system. Those within the NHS need to realize that the heads of that organization are corrupted and compromised. We need you all to come forward peacefully and start speaking about this and speaking out, OK? It's very important. And I will do another video on that uh, on my YouTube channel. How do you think the best approach is then if you're dealing with the police in some other function and you've got the opportunity to to talk to them and say, look, hang on a minute, um, there is bigger issues here. You may not know this. What would be the best way of approaching um, police officers? Because what what you you know most people go oh but that just sounds like conspiracy nonsense and as soon as you go down the conspiracy road to those people who are not open to it, they mm. just they clam up even more. Mm. Well, first of all, this can't be considered a conspiracy anymore because the documents are now in circulation, and it's black and white. You know, and the very clear evidence that people can be shown and see is um, the falsification of the company's register against the legal document anyone can log on now and look at a company if i was to give a name you would see that falsification a very clear 
forgery offence under the 2006 Fraud Act. OK, so under under that act, if anything is done in a legal register or a legal document that even just causes a risk of a loss to another person creating a victim or a risk, it doesn't even have to actually fulfil the risk. If there's a risk to an unlawful gain to somebody through that falsification, it is the, the offence is complete under the 2006 Fraud Act. So first of all, People need to understand that very clear black and white offence. Anyone can look at that, can see it. There's no explanation for it other than the company's house register has been forged by company's house itself because they control the register. They control the legal documents being attached to it. And the company's house is uh, controlled by the government. So the first thing is they need to see and understand that very clear fraudulent offence. And then to police officers and those in, again, it's important that those in the in the forces and the armed forces are aware of what's going on as well. Once you understand and agree that that is there and mm. it's no longer a conspiracy, you need to know the implications of that to you personally, to them personally. These yes. people have families. They have a roof over their head. Now, the very clear implication is that the taxation system is corrupted through this. So if you have uh, our tax contributions being paid into these companies, OK, we already have a risk of loss because they're being allowed to be trading unlawfully. That means they can't be held accountable or liable to anything that they do with our money. OK, so they can send it into offshore accounts, falsify the figures and get us to pay more tax. So I say to these people, they are the implica immediate implications to you because you could be paying, well, you will be paying more tax, way more tax than you should be because this system is being used. OK, so your cost of living is being affected 100 yeah. percent. And then, of course, you have the other effect. So if there's large conglomerate companies that are involved in this system of fraud and almost every large conglomerate company I've looked at has been set up fraudulently, that allows them the ability to uh, avoid paying tax. OK, through the offshore accounting system that's put in place, through Swift Incorporate, through the Swift transaction system that we've talked about. That means the rest of us are paying more tax, doesn't it? Yes. And, it yes. means, and the poor people that are on PAYE uh, systems through these large conglomerate companies, they're paying their tax through their employee who are involved in the fraud. And there's well, there is something they can do, but it, there's they're more powerless to stop paying their taxes um, to be able to not be part of it. It's just it's unreal, Richard, what's been going on. But I would also say to these people, the implications now are the child protection concerns. OK, now that will get to the hearts of most decent human beings, including the police and those in the forces. There is a very clear connection of a huge child trafficking, trafficking ring all the way through this fraud. OK, now I have information suggesting as many as 100,000 children are going missing from the UK care system every year, OK, in, in relation to this. It's a huge, huge problem. And there's some very sinister evidence going on in the background as to what may be happening to those children. Very sinister. Uh, I, OK, so I'm uh, you know, fairly ignorant on how the social system works in terms of children and the care system. Yep. Um, you know, when you say 100,000 children are disappearing, there must be a way for a, an accountability to say, well, where, hang on a minute, you, you had a, a 50 kids that you were looking after in your, in your building or your area, and now there's only 30. Where okay. are those missing? Where are those missing 20? I mean, how do you get the accountability so that we, the public, we, the people can go and put pressure on them to say, actually, we know what's going on, but we just want to find out where they are. You, you, is there accountability that we can have some influence on? The first thing I'd like to say to that, and I haven't publicised this uh, specifically in the videos, but the missing person reporting system is corrupted by this system of fraud, first of all. OK, right. so, so the figures are therefore corrupted. Um, it's very quickly, there's companies, I can't remember the specific wording, but it's something like the National Missing Person Reporting Company. Uh, I found through my research, I wasn't even looking for it. It just popped up as being linked to those involved in the system of fraud. So straight away, you have the, the ability to hide the true figures as to who's going missing. Now, in relation to how that system works, um, now, this is very deep, deep rooted, Richard, very, very deep rooted. So the information I have suggests that Companies House itself was probably set up 
around this system of fraud. Now, that was set up in 1844, okay, back before World War I. Um, and I believe that this has been used as a vessel for this system of fraud ever since. Ever since. And I also have information suggesting that the whole legal process has been set up uh, around this system of fraud. Okay, so the whole legal system, and now I've got a, I've got a video coming out in relation to a specific court case, um, but it suggests that there's a centralised system in place through the legal process that stops uh, stops it being exposed, basically, and stops leading to the exposure of the wider issue of the child trafficking connection as well. Uh, I mean, even the head of the uh, family courts is linked to this system of fraud. He's, he's the head of the family courts. He's mentioned in my videos, and he's straight into this system of fraud that links to child protection and child trafficking. It's huge. It's huge. Gosh, uh, the, the morals of the of these people is is beyond um, understanding, really. Um, have you got? I mean, the last time you came on the show and you you talked about this, and you know, you said you're on on the run, you're in the van, and you're this that, and the other. Have you now, as a result of the publicity of you exposing this, got people helping you? Uh, in other words, have you got a team so that it's not all on your shoulders to do this? There's incredible people offering to do uh, as much as they can. But the trouble is, this is I've got to be very careful because there will be lots of people involved in this that will try and infiltrate those teams. Uh, there's right. already people that I'm sure are contacting me trying to say the right things that are no doubt connected to this. Uh, and people, of course, wanting to meet up with me, some being extremely insistent on me meeting up with me. Now, I have right. to be mindful that if I meet with the wrong people and something happens, then it stops the evidence that I'm presenting in its tracks, in its tracks. Yes. So uh, there's been some incredible and there are people um, doing their own research, um, some information I wasn't even aware, aware of, which is very eye opening, in fact, um, which I haven't corroborated yet, but they've now been doing their own research on the back of mine and it's opening up even more of a can of worms in relation to the Madeleine McCann case, for example, uh, the Nicola Bully case um, and the child protection concerns. Um, so in answer to your question, I'm being very careful about forming too many teams in person, um, but it won't be far away that we will be forming um, teams uh, through uh, digital means to consider the next course of action. Yes. So, I mean, it strikes me that the more people, obviously the public, once the public know about this in wide numbers, in huge numbers, then it has to start to stop because once it's been exposed, you know, it can it can go no further. Um, they've, they've got nowhere to hide. Um, uh, presumably we're getting those sort of numbers but obviously not you know people are still unaware of what the pandemic was all about so it is always obviously a huge challenge but this at least is in black and white and you've got the documents that people can read um is i'm wondering if there is a connection with the stuff that you're exposing and the number of mps that are now stepping down and saying well, we won't be standing again and i think wanting to make a swift exit somewhere yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. I mean, I've mentioned this a lot, but um, some people are saying, well, you're quite egotistical if you're thinking this is down to you, Gary. Um, but I think you've only got to look at what's now been exposed with the evidence we've just shown and how far back it goes. This is the key. This is I can't emphasize this enough. This is the absolute key to most of the problems on the planet, because as soon as you can create a false, unlawful entity company, they can get away with blue murder. Now, yes. they can't be held accountable. And it, so if, if you strip it straight back to this basic principle of that fraud of the falsification of the register, that is the answer to everything. As soon as you create accountability and liability to individuals and companies, they're much less likely to be involved in, in a system such as this. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think things are really progressing. You know, lots of people have said, we need to get a solicitor and you need to go through the legal process and go to the high court. And there's no point doing that. It's absolutely pointless. Many people are trying it. I've been contacted by many people who are just hitting brick wall after brick wall. And that is because of this system of fraud has been set up around the legal process. There's barristers linked to it. There's solicitors mm -hmm. linked to it. Of course, you'll have innocent people. But like I said earlier, there's a centralized system. So it works its way up the chain. As soon as you get to a certain point, it's diverted or stopped from exposing the real problem.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and people, a, a, anybody who's been pushing back on all sorts of simple legal, th- I say simple things like the council tax and things, will know just how corrupt the courts are and mm. how uh, the bias in those courts are linked with the councils or with government and, and all of that. So yeah. I think a lot of, lot of my viewers will certainly be on the same page thinking, yeah, the last place you want to go is the so-called justice system. Yeah. Um, so... Um, where do we go? What, what would you like the, the viewer to do? Is, is there a thing? I mean, because people will be, as you say, I mean, not only just look at the documents and stuff, but can we, um, I, I mean, in the past you would say, oh, well, I shall write to my MP. Obviously, that's not going to make the blind bit of difference because they're all in on it, or at least most of them will be connected in some fashion. What can we do? People will be itching to do something. And I know my viewers are very proactive. Well, it's very important that we do follow due processes, although we can't do the normal process of employing a solicitor and going through the court process. We need to show that we've exhausted all other efforts. And that's very, very important because we want to gain as much support from everybody. And that Mm. includes those who will be saying, well, have you done this? Have you contacted, for example, NSPCC? They're now exposed as being linked through to the paedophile network, you know, through to the system of child concern. Uh, child line is linked through to it. So we need to get to the people that are going to be saying, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you followed every other avenue of opportunity? And eventually it will get to a point where um, now I'm already and I'm happy to disclose this because it's important that they know what's now being considered um, as a very last resort. You know, we, we may need to consider peaceful public arrest teams. OK, so yeah. get groups of people together with a strategic documented approach on how it would happen and we may need to actually consider doing citizens arrests on individuals to prevent this from happening in a peaceful way of course um and and i've got ideas on how that can work and how it needs to be documented and everything that needs to be put in place for that so that's now what we're starting to have to consider but there's certain uh things that still need to be exhausted so i would say going back to your question everybody still needs to uh Email and contact their MPs, contact your councillors. There's now been reference numbers for every, pretty much every police force around the country. I've set up a unique reference number which links to my evidence so members of the public can call that for, uh, their police force, uh, link it to that reference number. Um, and then eventually what we can do is collate this evidence from people that have done it. So letters that, uh, a certain amount of letters that have been sent to a specific MP, for example or a counsellor, uh, and then we can show that those individuals have had a chance to do their du- duty to highlight this concern with the evidence that's being shown to them. Um, and if they don't then do that, then you have the offence of conspiring to commit international fraud and international child trafficking. Now, politicians yes. are susceptible to that offence because they're in a position to change it. They're in a position to highlight it at least. And if they aren't doing their duty, then you have to consider they're conspiring to allow it to continue. Okay, if they've had these letters, they've had these emails, they're aware of the evidence, they've got an opportunity to speak out and do their duty and they're not. Why aren't they? Are they part of it? And of course, the information I've given, um, it now allows the ability to actually obtain evidence on these individuals through Companies House. So that's now starting to happen. So not only will we have the letters uh, informing them of what's happening and asking them to do something or they become complicit, we then have documents showing their direct or affiliated company association to this system of fraud and the link to child trafficking. So we can then expose them that way, you see, as well, and use that as the evidence for conspiring to commit these offences. So on your document link that you're going to give me and we put in the um in the description um will there be places for people to contact you've mentioned the nspcc and and childline you know if they if they are under a a deluge of uh, emails and letters from members of the public who are saying look we've we've discovered this we know this and they can quote the um the um the evidence then there's a higher chance that uh, we'll see these directors stepping down or trying to mitigate it or saying, okay, 
yeah, we may have been part of this, but we didn't know how far and how deep this is and or whatever. We may see some mm-hmm. good come. I mean, hopefully we see some good come from this as more and more people expose it. I mean, that seems to be the, the obvious thing so that they know the public knows. Yeah, Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I, I still... Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do know, but don't forget, I'm I'm emailing 650 MPs with the evidence continually. Yeah. You know, and then and then documenting that they've had that evidence. They yes. can't, as well as the email being sent from individuals, because it's important. It's not just me. You well, know, we need yeah, the that's... public to to really rally together on. It's kind of what I was getting at. You, the the more people are prepared to sort of just yeah. give that deluge, so that those people sitting yeah. there cannot cannot be silent cannot not reply they've yeah. either got to rebut it um with evidence or they've well they're not going to they're not going to admit to anything are they or or they've got to stand down yeah absolutely and we need to get them to, and i think it's starting to happen richard they're realizing that the game is up for starters but also right. that you know they're at risk now i don't want them to be at risk physically of course this no. needs to be done peacefully uh, and it needs to be done in the right way. Um, but they, of course, will be thinking, oh, my goodness me, I'm now at risk in this because what I'm part of is exposed. I haven't done anything about it. I'm getting all these emails and I'm being told not to respond by the powers that be and to try and let it go away. This isn't going to go away. So I think, you know, we'll get to a point uh, and you've already touched on it, that the MPs are resigning. I think there's been a, another three in the last few days. Uh, stepping down, in, including the head of the DUP, who was arrested for or being investigated for sexual offences. Um, they're now not uh, in a position of authority. So I think we want their shield to drop away. That's what we want. So yes. we need the police to be on board, the innocent police officers. We need the forces to be on board. On board. I think we're starting to get to that point. If we keep pursuing this in the way we are with the videos and everybody else sharing this information, they will, there will become a point where they, for example, if we go to arrest, do a citizen's arrest on a member of parliament and we call the police to come there and deal with it, you know, the, hopefully those police officers will realise, yes, we've now got to do something about this, you know. Um, and we need them to realise that shield is not going to be there for them. There's already signs of that happening. So Rishi Sunak, Sunak a few weeks ago, you may have seen it, uh, suggested that all MPs now to ha- need to have personal protection and bodyguards um, you know, they're already starting to realise, I think, where things are leading. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> and we don't, as you say, we don't want any violence. This That's the last thing, because that, that will work completely against us anyway, and it's not honourable in any shape or form. I, I was involved, uh, well, I went to a meeting last year. I can't remember exactly when it was now, but it was probably May time, May, June time, I think. Um, and one of the suggestions back then, this was a sort of just simply about not consenting to a number of things that were uh, threatening to happen. And um, one of the suggestions was that there was a letter to be given to police officers if you happen to see them. Um, so if you're just walking about or you're stopped for, for something, you had a, a letter that you that you could give to the police officer. I wondered if that concept would work just if you saw a policeman, you say, oh, by the way, you're a serving officer. Um, I just want to give you this. And it's a sort of noticed with the information that the evidence so that they in their own time can take that home and go, oh, blimey. I didn't know that or uh, this is this is, and can confer with their fellow colleagues so that you slowly bring the police force to an understanding of what what is actually going on. Because I imagine that many of them are in the dark. That's a great idea. I mean, that's something I haven't, I haven't thought of. And I think that's a fantastic idea. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, idea. I, can, I can't take the credit for that at all. But that, uh, another form of police officer um, came up with that concept. And uh, I mean, what we would need is is a letter to be drafted up. I don't know if that's something you could do. I know you're very busy, so that people could just download it, and it it has enough links in it and enough of a statement in it to just to get the police officer to go. Oh, and if it's if it's fashioned by another police officer, you would know the terms uh, and the right way of writing such a letter. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. There is a, there is a letter already in the document link. Uh, I mean, I'm not great at writing letters. I've done my best. But it is a, a letter that can be given to most organisations, really, including 
probably what you're saying, um, but I can do a specific specific one, of course, like you've said. I mean, I think that's a that's a very good idea. Very good idea. And especially if it's putting them personally liable, because once they've been told and then they no longer do anything about, they are part of the problem, aren't they? Of course. And we've got to hope that the moral conscience is still alive in most people and that most people have got a, a moral compass. Um, yes. including well, I, do, I, I absolutely do believe that. It, it, mm-hmm. You know, you've just got to get past the training, I guess. Yes, yes, um, yes. But I think ultimately, you know, there is good in everybody, even the, even the bad people who are perhaps greedy and just thought, oh, this is a gravy train and, and I don't have to think about the consequences. I just do this. And I'm even those people, I think at some somewhere deep inside their psyche, if you can reach them, they will they will do it, whether they will do it willingly or not, unless they are realized the game is up. That's another thing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, I, com- I completely agree with you, Richard. And I think it's important that we do understand that there is good in all people. And even, you know, even, the, and you may not agree with this, but I think even the people at the very top of this are probably going to be, you know, having deep thoughts about where this is heading and what's happening to the world because of this. Um, so I completely agree with that. And that might be what, you know, if we can reach those, uh, the good moral conscience within these individuals, that might be what turns the tide for us all. Yes. Well, let, let's hope it is, uh, uh, because this has got to stop. And I think this is the year. I mean, this is a very important year. I mean, the, the Pam Gregory, the astrologer, is talking about it. Many of the guests that I've had on the show are aware that this is the time of great revelations. Um, and we, we may go through this shaky period. Um, and if they do start to, and we start hear noises about the CBDCs and the fact that cash is disappearing, again, it, it it's like that the food shortage until there are no until the shelves in the supermarkets have no food on them or the shortages is when the general public get out of that complacency and start to go oh actually I ought to do something maybe I ought to go to a farm shop or maybe I I ought to do something about this because they may not know the bigger picture but they know it's affecting them right now and um, and that's what we want. So so if cash is being threatened to take away, but perhaps that's going to be a big motivator to actually push forward and say, actually, we don't want that. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's lots of lots of things that I'm finding out about that I didn't know about. I had an interesting conversation with somebody yesterday and I've identified that the um, child benefit system. So, you know, when families separate and there's money to be paid to the uh, ex-partner, for example, to help look after the children. Even that system is corrupted by this. And what appears to be happening is that person is not receiving the full money yes. that the other person is, you know, and they found that these companies are actually part of this system of fraud. So false entity company creation. So, of course, the rest of the money will be sent into offshore accounts and being put, you know, and that will touch a lot of people because there's a lot of people within that system of child uh, maintenance and payments. I I interviewed a a gentleman again only a few weeks ago on that very issue. And it was an an incredible eye opener. And he was saying that the the accounts of... um, the far, it's mostly you know, 90% of these are fathers who are being targeted, obviously it's 10% of women who are responsible for paying maintenance. It's not going to the other partner with the children. And the, yeah. the um, executives who are looking after or supposedly looking after them can have access to that um, maintenance paying um, parent um, to their personal account. And they can just whip the money and say, oh, I've paid it. And it's not being paid. I mean, the, the amount of fraud is just so eye-watering. It's amazing it's not been exposed. And it's amazing it's gone on for so long. Yes. But, yes, it's uh, just, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling, isn't it, really? It's, it's just uh, hard to comprehend, hard to, hard to comprehend how we've got to this point, uh, this deep level of corruption. It's just, it's not I, good. I do think now, though, I mean, you've come forward as um, uh, as somebody who's, who's, you know, like a knight in shining armor but, or shining a light on the fraud, if you like. Mm-hmm. And more and more people are beginning to go, wake up to the amount of different types of fraud. I mean, most people are aware of how the council tax is now sort of not quite right, even if they don't know the machinations of it. Um, 
And this tight squeeze that we're all feeling is pointing people into saying, hang on a second, a bit like the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, I think it was. Um, but what we don't want, as, you, as we've said, is the people rising up violently, but they can rise up using the power of the pen, the internet, videos, this sort of thing. This, this is our medium. Of course, of course. And we do. I mean, lots of people are afraid to do it, but I've done it. I'm withholding all of my tax contributions. Now I'm, yeah. I'm, I have to do a self-assessment normally. I haven't even done my self-assessment return. I've always paid my taxes, always. But I can't pay my taxes lawfully now. I can't pay it because I've become aiding and abetting the suffering of innocence. I'm not going to do it. No. I'm not going to do it. There's systems they can put in place to show us that's not happening and they're not doing it. You know, it's not like they don't have any option to, on where to go with this to reassure us all. They have the option. They're not doing it. So, you know, that is, again, something that people can do and, and something that I've exposed recently. And uh, again, this has now exposed the, um, the bailiff procedure uh, and the system of repossessions of houses. That is now exposed as part of this fraudulent system. So the company, uh, I was actually, I don't know if you might not have seen the video, but by chance, I um, was uh, responding to an email. This was since I last did the interview with you. Responding to an email uh, to somebody, and I thought, you know, I'm going to give them a call as well. And I don't normally. Gave them a call. I was on the phone, and he said, Gary, I'm literally, uh, the bailiffs are at my door. They're smashing my door in now. Bloody and hell. I and yeah, literally. And I recorded, I got my wife, I said, look, record this call quickly. We need to expose this. And we recorded the whole thing. We recorded the whole thing. The police turned up. 21 police officers turned up. With the bailiffs, they had a group of uh, 19, well, there were two numbers were given to me, because obviously I wasn't there, 19 to 23 um, people that appeared to be uh, not from this country, let's say, and that they've recently got here. They had no identification on them. And, and sure enough, there were other people that had videoed this, and I've seen the videos, and it's true. And the bailiffs company is an unlawful entity. So I looked into the bailiff company. They haven't even been registered lawfully. So, of course, that means anything they do is unlawful because a lawful, an unlawful entity cannot act in any way lawfully. That no. includes damaging somebody's door to gain repossession of their property. That becomes criminal damage. And then all of the police ten that turn up and become involved, that becomes unlawful. So if they end up arresting somebody for a breach of the peace, it's not a lawful arrest because no. the original company that started the breach of the pre peace is an unlawful entity. So you can see how powerful this is now uh, becoming. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, just to say, I've got um, a lady coming on the show in a, a week or two's time who was evicted um, and uh, had all that problem. And then the house was reclaimed because it was completely proved that it was unlawful. And she's now back in. And we are seeing more of that. Um, but the use of these... Um, people who, as you say, are not uh, originally from this country that suddenly seem to be in some sort of security role or, uh, you, you know, as in uh, uh, the video I saw was them all linked hands around the house as this mm. poor woman was being dragged out of her house. Um, and you just think th the amount of intimidation and harassment in this, and, and then at the end of the day, it's completely fraudulent. I mean, it's just not acceptable and the public... Uh, we should not be accepted and cannot roll over and just say, oh, that's a shame. No, it's got to stop. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, these people that, have, that are here have come over to this country, they, they probably don't even know what they're part of. They're just being given money, which yes. we all need to survive. So they're just trying to survive. You know, they're, and, you know, I reach out to those people on here. You know, if, if you need to realise what you're part of as well here, our government is corrupt. It's very simple. And you are helping to enforce a corrupt system. Now, I, I actually suspect that, um, you know, we all know that since Brexit, that was supposed to have been there to prevent immigration. It appears that we've had more immigration since. Now, I actually suspect that that's a deliberate attempt, potentially, for them to then become involved in controlling the general public if we do end up. Uh, taking any sort of action to the streets. I actually think they're potentially there for that very reason. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's it, I mean, these guys at the, bless them, you know, nothing against any of these guys, you know, they're, 
you know, I'd love to have a meeting with them and sit down and tell them what's going on and realise what they're part of. But none of them had, um, I think there was two of them that had their SAI badges, I think they're called SAI badges, aren't they? Uh, on display, you know, at this house eviction. All the rest of them refused to even show their badges. Now, there's a law, yeah. there's a law that says if you're interacting with the public, you have to display your badge. And they yes. weren't doing it. And the police were there. The police were there. They were being informed of this. And they did nothing. They, did, they nothing. did nothing. And nothing. I, it, and, and, yeah, I mean, I'm speechless. <laughs> I am speechless because I'm hearing this uh, from various different people. Uh, and mm. you just think, how in the world can somebody be given the privilege of the uniform of a police officer to protect the public, uh, which, in my mind having been brought up from the 1960s and, and seeing things like Dixon of Doc Green and things like that, uh, you know, is a noble profession to be a police officer and how it has changed and that they will just, I mean, in my case, when I had the enforcement officers and I asked one of the three that turned up uh, in three police cars, are you acting as a constable? And the first one sort of just said, yeah. And the second one just laughed and he said, I don't care. And I just thought to myself, hang on a minute, you are the people that we, the public, are depending on. We have nowhere else to go. You can't go and ask the army to intervene. You are uh, supposedly our saviours in these difficult situations. It's a civil matter anyway. <laughs> it's not even a criminal offence. And three of you are wasting your time talking to me and this enforcement, the third party interloper, about a monetary matter that has nothing to do with the police where there is real crime going on and you're you're denying whether or not you are a constable or whether it matters to you or not and and to be honest these were the three of the scruffiest policemen i've ever seen um it was just outrageous i mean all of, I, just I mean, I mean i don't know if it's 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 police issue now but he sort of had what looked like to me as black tr tr um jogging long jogging bottoms on is that what a policeman wears these days i mean it was like it was like jogging bottoms they weren't it weren't it wasn't like the old-fashioned nice wool trail i mean i used to do extra work on the bill thames television the bill and so i used to know what a police officer would wear because we used to dress up like them in the 90s um when i used to do a bit of that i was a bit of white shirt behind a frosted glass window at the end of the corridor type of in the background type of acting uh, I mean, it's still a bit nonsense, really. But we used to have to dress up in a, you know, with a storno and all of that. And these guys, when they turned up, I just thought, you're a Mickey Mouse policeman. What is, yeah, what I mean, is... yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I understand what you're saying, but there's also an, an element of practicality in what they wear, isn't it? You know, these guys are having to roll around on the floor and chase people, and you know that does happen. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, so there's an element of practicality about what they're wearing. But you're right, you know, it's, um, it doesn't look great. Uh, but these guys, and I will keep coming back to this, you know, these guys are in a very difficult position and most of them are good guys. They're trying to do the best. And uh, it's the same as the legal system. There's a centralised system in place. So if there's anything they're unsure of, they'll contact their sergeant. The sergeant will then contact the inspector. You've only got to have it get to a certain point and someone's involved that doesn't want to expose something. And then it gets fed back down to that officer on the ground. And they just they follow orders. Of course they do. You know, that's... Mm. They're worried about their jobs. Um, and, I, and I will come back to what I said to you in the last interview. I think I saw, unbelievably, <laughs> I saw little to no corruption for my whole time in the 18 years of policing. And since I've left the police, it's just unreal. But, it, you know, I'll come back to it's the ones in the tops of these organisations. If we don't resolve that, and it includes the government, we're never going to resolve these problems. We have no. to aim for the top. I totally agree, uh, but there is um, there is a, a, a an awareness now that the the excuse I'm just doing my job is not good enough. If if you're there and you're seeing a disabled person being thrown onto the street in the most um, gratuitous way, and you're standing back as a constable of the uh, police, and you're just doing your job and you're not interve intervening as somebody to stop the um, keeping the peace, I mean that that's intolerable. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. In that sort of situation, of course. And I, I'll tell you about an interesting story. When uh, when I first joined the police, actually, and it's very relevant to what you're talking about, uh, we went to a particular job. This was when I was in Kent Police. 
and it was a guy in his back not back garden it was his family's back garden with a knife threatening his family and we turned up with quite a few of us and we managed to detain this guy got him on the floor got him handcuffed and because he was being uh, uh, abusive the sergeant that was with us sprayed him in the face with um i think it was it was, it was cs spray at that point cs spray it sprayed him in the face and I knew that was wrong and I said something. I actually went into the office with my sergeant because don't forget, we've got the family watching this. This mm. person's already detained. They're already no longer a threat. Right. We have to be the better people and we cannot use that level of force. But it happened and I did witness that. So although I said I didn't witness corruption, that was probably one of the worst things I did see. And I went and uh, I actually did the right thing and I went and sat with my sergeant privately and I said, look, I hope you don't mind. I just want to tell you, I don't think that was appropriate what you did. And I want to let you know about that. Um, and he said, well, you, you know, you can take this further if you want uh, and you can escalate this if you want. Anyway, I got moved from my, that squad. I got moved to another squad. Uh, you know, it was clear that that wasn't the sort of thing you should be doing. But that was the right thing to do. Um, so, yeah, there is this element of isolation, uh, potential isolation to officers that do say something when everyone else isn't. You know, but uh, I, I mean, that was quite a few years ago. But, yeah, you're right. You know, there is no excuse to sit back and watch and do nothing when you know something's wrong. And again, it comes back to the moral conscience, you know, doesn't it? It's the principles and morals that we all hold. And we know that's wrong. Yes. We know it's wrong. Yes, you know? about, uh, and, and we need to see more. I mean, we've heard that there are these whistleblowers and, of course, whistleblowers are um are quickly shifted away or quietened up or paid off or whatever they are or yeah. are made to look like fools uh but if we don't have whistleblowers and admittedly some will have grudges and what they're saying may not be accurate anyway and we would all have to do our due diligence on that but um when and and i've seen this with people trying to um report a crime to the mm. police and the police are almost we, we won't accept it uh, and it's usually, it's not, oh, my dog's gone missing. Yeah, we can put that in the dog. But uh, mm -hmm. if it's something like fraud, it, the big fraud that is really big, it is almost like, well, we don't want to touch this. Uh, I, can't, I can't deal with this. And how well, do we get like, around I think, that? I think it's worse than that, actually, Richard. I think they've actually set up, you've got the Action, action Fraud Department. Okay, there, Everybody is directed to Action Fraud. So uh, any element of fraud, phone up action fraud or do an online report. So somebody went in undercover. There's a, there's a little uh, YouTube video that I've actually mentioned in one of my videos. And someone went undercover into the national crime, uh, sorry, into the action fraud office. It's a shambles. It's a shambles. And they're even appearing to be trained to um, not investigate things. So they literally just file it away almost immediately. Some things they may send to the, because it goes through to the National Intelligence Bureau from the uh, fraud, action fraud. Um, but this is the thing that's in play. And this is one of the reasons I left the police. I left the police in 2018. And one of the reasons was because they were looking for reasons not to investigate a crime rather than looking for reasons to investigate it. And that became quite obvious. Now, obviously, at that time, um, that was when, I don't know if you recall, Theresa May was in power and there was a reduction of 20,000 police officers. Oh, yes. Now, that... That links directly now to this system of fraud, which we can go into another time if you like. But that then meant the police were struggling and I was in the police. So they couldn't, they didn't have the, the manpower or the ability to deal with every crime as it should be. So they were under pressure. Now I'm not making excuses no. because it, it's direct. In fact, it's this system of fraud is the reason for this, which I will mention in a minute. Remind me, please. But we were literally, uh, we wouldn't have had time to have investigated every crime uh, as we normally would. And that's why I think the pressure was on the powers above to look at the crimes that the frontline officers were taking on and looking for reasons not to continue an investigation because they knew the manpower wasn't there. But let's go back to the fraud. So this is why it relates very heavily to this. And it's one of the reasons I left. But at that point, I didn't know what was going on. So Theresa May... Uh, introduced the Policing and Crime Commissioner's offices, office, office, okay? So there's a Policing and Crime Commissioner at the side uh, or in another office, but they work closely with every Chief Constable. And in fact, they can hold the Chief Constables accountable. 
but they are not police officers. They're from most of them are from business backgrounds. OK, so Theresa May introduced them. They are corrupted by this system of fraud immediately. You can look at Companies House. I've already shown the connection through to them. They're still there in power now. They are still there overseeing the forces. OK, she also introduced the National Crime Agency. Uh, there's evidence to suggest they're involved and they were actually dissolving their company after because they've got a company on company's house linked to them. Um, that was dissolving. Um, so and what the, the what this means is um, sorry. So also Theresa May's husband um, around the time I was in force, we were told that she her husband may have had an affiliation to Group 4 Security. Now, Group 4 Security are linked to this system of fraud very quickly. And what appeared to have been happening is the reduction in police officers' numbers then led to private contracts being given to Group 4 Security to deal with the things that we would normally have dealt with as police officers. OK, but of course, if they're part of the system of fraud, then all of the money, taxation money going in through to it goes out the back door through to the through using the forged documents. So, it ha so what I'm trying to say is this system of fraud was directly linked to the problems that I've just explained mm. are why the force was being pushed into not investigating crimes when they should have should have been. And that was one of the reasons I left, because I realised I couldn't help Mrs. Miggins anymore. You know, I wanted to help yes. Mrs. Miggins that had been burgled. And, but we were being told, or not told, but compelled not to investigate things when we should do. It is a, I mean, it's just, it's a complete and utter mess. But um, thanks thanks to uh, people like yourself, we're beginning to get, as I said before, the light sh shined much more publicly on it. And really, the internet and platforms like this and the many others are, are the gift that is going to solve this by making it publicly aware so that people can see, read and, uh, and actually take part, as we mentioned before, by writing to MPs and the all the other organizations that may be linked on this you've got your um youtube channel which i shall put in the uh description of course you mentioned this document link um i will put that in what can people expect to find on on that so all of the evidential documents research documents that i'm showing in my videos are on there okay yeah. so you, you know it's nice to actually be able to look at the document isn't it follow follow the evidential links through uh, there's also uh, a document within there with the police reference numbers for every force where I've contacted every force so people can refer back to those. And if they want, call the police to express their protest of concern as to what's going on as well. Uh, within there, there are some uh, a couple of useful performer documents, template documents that people can send and some examples of some other great emails that have been sent to MPs by others as well. Um, and that will be that I'll add documents to that as time goes on. So that will just hopefully build and become more useful as time goes on. Fantastic. Gary, it's been a joy to catch up with you. No doubt we will uh, we'll have to catch up again in a, in a month or so, as I feel that this is going to escalate um, uh, for the good. Um, and we need to be quick before all this nonsense uh, goes in. Uh, thank you so, so much for making the time to speak with me today. Um, and good luck with all you do. Uh, stay safe and, um, as ever, keep up the good work. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for all you're doing. You're a good man. Oh, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, as I say, the links will be in the description. Do check them out. Uh, it will be great if Gary can put together a, 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 a simple letter that we can hand to police officers when we're out and about and just hand them a cell. By the way, I've, I've got this for you. Don't have to do any more than that. And uh, that just puts them on notice. That would be rather, rather good. Um, but all the other different things that we've talked about that you might want to get involved with. I'll be back with more monologues and, of course, some more wonderful guests. And no doubt Gary will be back with uh, more information on uh, how it is all going. But in the meantime, thank you for watching. From Gary and I, take care. Bye for now.